Hey, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Diane Walton. For those of you who I do not know, um, I have the rare privilege of serving on the Baykeeper board here in the Bay Area. And um, it's it's a thrill to get to be part of it. And it's um, I'm so grateful to be able to be part of tonight where you're gonna hear Sejal talk about all the things that Baykeeper is up to and the big victories that um, she's just, knocked down over the past couple of years. So, and what we're looking forward to, but as you come in, there are people on Zoom and there are people on Facebook. And because we all believe in technology, we just know it's all gonna work so that the questions that come in are gonna get melded and we'll have a time for Q&A at the end. You'll see a Q&A box um, down below. So now you're in the chat and then, but for Q and A, you're gonna move over a little bit. So be careful about that. We have, somebody has already clicked the caption button. So that should be working. There's a black a menu at the bottom of the Zoom window for the captioning. And we are recording of course, and we'll share it with you. Um, one thing we wanted to do before we got started was the land acknowledgement. It's as we begin, Baykeeper wants to acknowledge that we are on the land of many native peoples and tribal groups who came to this region before us and who still live here today. We recognize them as the authentic stewards of the land and of San Francisco Bay, and we respectfully support their efforts for indigenous sovereignty and repatriation. In their honor, we pledge to take action to protect the shared waters that make up the Bay and its vast watershed. So, um, heart. Um, so, Baykeeper, most people who are joining tonight, there's know what Baykeeper is. It's we've been around for 35 years now, amazing with fabulous supporters like you, making it possible for to be the this this wild combination of science and litigation. Act on fact. It's not always popular these days, but these guys are fabulous. And they patrol the bay, which is a thing that's near and dear to my heart in the activity portfolio that nobody else is out there hunting down polluters and going after them. And um, and the fact that the baykeeper does that and wins um, 300 successful legal actions to date really, really has um, helped keep the bay as healthy as it is today but we still need so much more. So without any further ado, I want to introduce Sejal. For those of you who don't know Sejal, what a treat you're in for. And for those of you who do, you knew that was coming anyway. She's uh, been at Baykeeper. She came straight out of law school in 2022 and um, is having, so she had 22 year career to defending the Bay. So I think the notes here might be wrong because she couldn't have left law school in 2022. But anyway, 22 years of fabulous work, and join me in welcoming Sejal to provide us with updates on the state of the Bay. Thanks so much, Diane. Of I course. I love that intro. Uh, <laughs> I have definitely been around uh, in the Bay uh, sphere longer than, than two years. <laughs> it's been 2002 is what that probably should have said. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. These are my favorite kind of events. You guys know that. I love having all of our supporters gathered in one room. And I think we have a lot of new folks here today too. So as Diane mentioned, I'm Sejal. I'm the executive director of San Francisco Baykeeper. And I am so excited about sharing with you tonight some of the things that we've been working on, some of the big issues that have been impacting the Bay. And I'm just gonna go ahead and get us started. So I am sharing my screen. Hopefully you guys can see that. No, I'm going to try that one more time because that looked like it maybe didn't work. Okay, can, uh, can somebody tell me if that worked? Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yes. Yay, thank you. Um, all right, so, so let's get started. Um, as I mentioned, we are here today to learn about some issues impacting the Bay, and it truly warms my heart to see how many people are here on a Wednesday 
afternoon, evening, when it's so gorgeous outside. I really love that you guys are here to learn about the Bay and to hear what we've been up to. You are amazing for caring about the problems facing the Bay, and you're really smart to educate yourselves about how we can tackle those issues. So tonight, I'm going to share some of the major news from the last year um, and how Baykeeper and our supporters are making a big difference. So that's you making a big difference. So let's go. Let's start with some context about tonight's event and about the Bay. So if you're up for it, I would really love for you to engage with us tonight. I know we have some new friends here from the Dolphin Club, the South End, the St. Francis, Patagonia, Levi's, and maybe even more. So if this is your first time at a Baykeeper event, can you put the one in, a, in the chat, the number one? Awesome, yay, welcome you guys. This is amazing. Thank you for being here and for being curious about the Bay and for wanting to make the Bay Area a healthier place to live. And I also think that we've got some longtime supporters here. If you guys are here and you're a Baykeeper supporter, can you guys put a two in the chat so we can see you? Yay, trickling in. Oh yes, so many people, that's awesome. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, I really am so grateful to all of you. Um, I hope that as you hear the updates tonight, you're gonna feel as proud of the accomplishments as I do because you're really helping us make an impact. And for everyone, if you hear something you like, please feel free to blow up the chat box with emojis and comments. I really would love to see what you're excited about. And of course, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box at any time. Diane and our staff are gonna be collecting and answering those questions as we go. And as long as I don't talk too long, we'll, we'll respond to some of those questions at the end. So now put your thinking caps on because I've got a pop quiz for you. And I know I can hear you groaning through the screen, but it's going to be pretty straightforward. <laughs> if the staff could please post the questions, that would be great. Um, this is going to give you a little bit of context for the presentation tonight. I will give you a few seconds to respond. Yeah, they're just true false questions, pretty straightforward. Don't worry, you won't be graded. Just take your best guess. And when we've got about 75% participation, we'll review the answers together. I think we're almost there. A couple more seconds, get those answers in. All right, great. Let's review. Oh. Oh my, you guys are smart art. Okay, <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Um, let's get going on the responses. So I don't, maybe don't even have to go over the responses because you guys all did so well. Um, the first one was actually meant to be a little bit of a trick question. The Clean Water Act was adopted in 1972 and it helped spark new regulations that definitely helped reduce some pollution in the Bay like trash and raw sewage. But when we're talking about certain less visible pollutants like nitrogen, mercury, uh, selenium, microplastics, the Bay is sadly more polluted than ever. So from Baykeeper's perspective, question number one was false. Question number two is also false. The Bay is a mix of salt water from the ocean and fresh water from the two biggest rivers in California, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin. These rivers meet in the Delta and flow out the Bay. And this creates a unique ecosystem for hundreds of plants and fish and wildlife, some of which I'll talk about later tonight. And finally, for those of you who receive our monthly alerts, you know that this last question was false too. This is one of the reason Baykeeper exists, to watchdog the local agencies because they don't always do the right thing. I'll talk more about this tonight too. So you guys did so great. I'm gonna give you an A plus, good job. Now, did you know that San Francisco Bay is one of the most urban estuaries in the world? That means that there are many urban impacts and sources of pollution. And I'm about to share a lot of numbers with you, but don't worry, I'm not gonna give you another quiz. 
I just want to give you some context for the updates I'm about to share. So less than half of the water in the Bay's upstream river makes it to the Bay because of water diversions. There are five oil refineries and two coal facilities in the Bay Delta that contribute a lot of toxic pollution to the Bay and to nearby neighborhoods. There's more than 1,600 industrial facilities that pollute the Bay and neighborhoods with chemicals, industrial metals, and oil and grease. There are 37 sewage treatment plants that dump wastewater in the Bay, and that includes dumping 90 tons of nitrogen and phosphorus daily. These are the pollutants that cause algal blooms. There are 86 different major cities that contribute polluted runoff to the Bay every time it rains. And there are more than a thousand toxic shoreline sites that were former military or industrial operations that will likely flood and leach toxins when sea level rises around the bay in the next 10 to 50 years. And many of these toxic sites, like Hunter's Point in San Francisco, are already experiencing groundwater rise right now. The bay faces these threats and more every single day. So let's move on to the latest news about some of these threats around the Bay. I'm gonna cover three big topics in my update tonight. First, freshwater flows. This is the amount of water coming from the Bay's upstream rivers that I just mentioned. Second, fossil fuel pollution. I'll let you know what's new with coal and oil around the Bay. And third, I'll share some updates about the sewage and stormwater pollution coming from our cities including breaking news on a polluter we just caught red-handed. As I mentioned, most of the water from snowmelt in the Sierras that should flow west towards the Pacific Ocean never reaches San Francisco Bay. That's because about half of the Central Valley's river flows are diverted to farms and cities outside of the Bay's watershed. And in the past year, state agencies have proposed more diversions in the form of the Delta Tunnel and the site's reservoir project, to the point where key native fish are going extinct. So here's what's happening. Last year, the Newsom administration proposed building a tunnel in the Delta. This red line shows how the tunnel will divert water out of the Sacramento River before it can reach the Bay. That would instead send the Bay's water to Southern California cities and industrial agriculture. It's not the first time something like this has been proposed and failed. The project is flawed because the state's CEQA or California Environmental Quality Act review shows that they failed to consider the tunnel's impacts on tribal people or on the communities who rely on the Delta for water. And the state failed to properly mitigate the harm to fish and wildlife that are already struggling to survive. The tunnel also violates a state law known as the Delta Reform Act. This law requires California to reduce its reliance on the Delta and to restore the Delta. Instead, the proposal does the opposite by threatening to increase Southern California's dependency on the Delta for water supplies and harming the, the ecosystem. This is why this past January, Baykeepers and our partner sued the state to stop the Delta Tunnel. Our lawsuit asks the court to keep water in the Sacramento River so the fish, wildlife, and communities that depend on cold, fresh flowing water can survive. Similar to the Delta Tunnel project, the Newsom administration also just proposed a new project last year that's a series of diversions and dams in the Sacramento Valley. This infrastructure project, known as the Sites Reservoir Project, would divert even more water from the Sacramento River. But as I mentioned, the river is already overtapped. Fish are going extinct, fisheries are collapsing, and the Delta tribes and communities are suffering. Less fresh water in the Delta is also leading to severe toxic algal blooms and higher water pollution concentrations. The sites project would exacerbate all of these problems. That's why Baykeeper and our partners just filed a legal opposition to the sites project. 
During the hearings this summer, we'll be urging the State Water Board to reject the site's application and protect water quality, fisheries, and wildlife for all those who depend on these waters. And just to be clear, we're not just opposing these projects. We're also proposing solutions to better use California's existing water resources. The state needs to maximize water supplies by investing in more robust water recycling, stormwater capture, and water conservation. There's enough water in our system for all of California's needs if the state just makes science-based policy choices. Real quick, can someone tell me in the chat what one thing fish need the most to survive? Hint, this is not a trick question. Okay, I see it, I see it. Oh, I see lots of good answers in here. Okay. All of these are related, all of your answers are great and they're all related to one thing cold, fresh flowing water. I love that you guys are paying such close attention. The watershed's fish need cold, fresh flowing water to survive and spawn, but our state agencies are failing to provide that basic need. And many other animals need these fish to survive. As more water is diverted, fish populations decrease and a domino effect occurs throughout the food web, starving everything from osprey to orca whales in the ocean. Long fin smelt is a native fish that has declined 99% in the Bay since the late 1980s. But California has repeatedly failed to improve Bay Delta water quality standards, which would protect long fin smelt and many other fish. So Baykeeper sued the Biden administration last April to list the smelt as a federal endangered species. And we won, but when you know it, the federal government missed their deadline to list the species last fall. So we had to sue them again in December. Once we win and longfin smelt are federally listed, the US Fish and Wildlife Service will have to require California to increase freshwater flows into the Bay during certain months in order to protect the longfin smelt. San Francisco Bay and its watershed are also home to the only known population of white sturgeon in California. White sturgeon have been around for about 46 million years. They are the ultimate survivors, but excessive water diversions and overfishing have caused the population to decline by 80%. The white sturgeon population has also been directly harmed by the two consecutive years of harmful algal blooms in the Bay. So Baykeeper and our partners just petitioned the state to list the white sturgeon as threatened under the California Endangered Species Act. And we also petitioned the federal government to list the Bay's white sturgeon as threatened under the federal Endangered Species Act. When this fish is listed in both ways, state agencies will have to adopt rules and make decisions that protect them. And finally, we've got the iconic Chinook salmon. I just saw sad news yesterday that there are too few salmon in the Bay's watershed this year. So California may have to close the fishing season again before it starts this May. The state closed the salmon fishing season last year too, for only the third time in the state's history. Last month, Governor Newsom unveiled a plan that claimed it would help California's embattled salmon fishery. But the plan completely ignored the Bay's salmon populations. Like all other fish, salmon need water to survive. But Newsom's new plan does not restore flows in the Bay's rivers. Instead, the state has actively undermined development of better water policies while promoting harmful new dams and water diversions including the two projects I just mentioned, the Delta Tunnels and the Sites Project. The governor's plans will actually harm more salmon than help them in the Bay Delta. So in addition to challenging those two infrastructure projects and fighting to get endangered species listings for the Bay's fish, Baykeeper and our partners have two pending lawsuits to force the state to adopt stronger water quality policies that would improve freshwater flows to the Delta. 
And that's the crazy news on flows. Now on to fossil fuels. As many of you know, the fossil fuel industry has a strong hold around the Bay Area. We have many active refineries, two of the West Coast's only coal export hubs, and a number of various projects in the works. In fact, did you know that there was a recent proposal to create a new oil drilling field in Brentwood right next to homes and schools? I can't even believe we had to waste our time opposing a harmful project like that in a city in the Bay Area in 2023. Thanks to the good organizing work of our partners at Sunflower Alliance, Brentwood just nixed that terrible idea. But it goes to show that the fossil fuel industry is trying to expand its polluting hold over the Bay Area. So let's go over some other ways that we're standing up to this dirty industry. A few years ago, someone called our hotline to report pollution at a facility at the Port of Venetia. Our field investigator captured drone footage that showed clouds of black dust floating in the air and black plumes of soot spreading in the bay six different times. We researched and discovered the pollution was petroleum coke, the leftover waste of oil refining that this company, Amports, ships overseas to be burned for energy. The pollution was getting into the bay, into Benicia neighborhoods, and contributing to the global climate crisis. So we sued Amports. Instead of cleaning up the port's operations, Amports got defensive and blamed Valero, the oil refinery that produces the pet coke. So we added Valero to our lawsuit because no company is too big to be held accountable, even if it's number 16 on the Forbes Fortune 500. So now we're in the middle of a legal battle to make sure these polluters clean up their mess and stop polluting. The latest update is that since we caught them red-handed, Valero realizes they will have to agree to a specific plan and a timeline to clean up the operations and comply with the law. But Amports has not been as cooperative. So if the companies don't work with us to solve the pollution problems, we'll be going to trial against them in federal court next year. And then we've got updates on Oakland Coal. For nearly 10 years, a developer has been attempting to build a new export terminal in Oakland. And for many years, they tried to hide that they wanted to send 9 million tons of coal from Utah through the terminal. Because of Baykeeper's successful prior case to reduce pollution from the Levin Coal Terminal in Richmond, we know a terminal in Oakland would be bad news. It would mean more trains moving through Bay Area cities shedding hundreds of pounds of coal dust in their wake. It would be a facility on the shoreline spilling toxic coal into the bay and it would increase the rates of asthma and heart disease for the already burdened residents of West Oakland. So Baykeeper and our partners sued the developer to stop the project. After a long drawn out legal battle between us and the developers that evolved into a contract dispute between them and the city of Oakland, last month, a judge sided with the coal industry. I know, really depressing, but, we actually see this loss as just one small setback in a grassroots campaign that has succeeded in delaying the coal terminal for nearly 10 years. And we're not done fighting. We're gonna continue partnering with local residents to block big coal and keep toxic pollution out of Oakland. And finally, two new, new fossil fuel threats that we're tackling. I'm curious, can you put a one in the chat if you've ever seen a coal train around the Bay Area? I have seen them in Richmond and they are a big mess. Across the US, trains transport nearly a billion tons of coal annually. Each open train car pollutes approximately 500 pounds of coal per trip. Coal dust blows off the trains and into nearby waterways. It also gets into neighborhoods where it can cause severe health problems. The Clean Water Act gives EPA the authority to control this pollution, but the agency has failed to do that. So this year, Baykeeper partnered with a dozen frontline groups across the country to petition EPA to regulate coal trains. 
as the Bay's lawyers were asking the agency to do its job so that the Bay Area can be free of coal and toxic dust. The Clean Water Act also requires EPA to limit the pollutants from oil refineries and tighten those limits every five years when treatment technologies improve. But EPA has never set limits for some of these oil pollutants, and it has failed to update the limits for refineries since 1985. That's right, about 40 years. That means the Bay Area's refineries dumped 1,057 pounds of selenium, 1.2 pound, million pounds of nitrogen, 32,298 pounds of oil and grease, 525 pounds of arsenic, 271 pounds of lead, 196 pounds of cyanide, 142 pounds of hexavalent chromium, and more into the bay. And that was just in 2021. That's a lot of pollution. Scientists have found that this pollution is causing toxic deformities in fish that swim near the refinery outfalls. And we know it can't be good for all of the other animals and people in the area. That's why Baykeeper and some national partners recently filed a lawsuit to force EPA to do its job and crack down on the pollution from oil refineries. Because you all and the Bay Area should be safe from this toxic pollution. And now moving on to our final topic, sewage and stormwater. When it rains, the stormwater washes all the pollution and trash on city streets into storm drains. Many people don't realize that when it rains, the Bay Area's old cracked sewage pipes also get inundated. And sometimes this leads to sewage spills and sometimes this leads to sewage getting into the storm drains. For most cities around the Bay Area, this means that every time it rains, polluted stormwater and untreated sewage gets into local rivers and creeks and the Bay. Our investigators recently sampled the stormwater runoff coming from the streets of Sunnyvale and Mountain View. We found that the city's runoff contained high levels of E. coli bacteria that were as much as 50 times what's legally allowed. And this bacteria was getting into local creeks every time it rained. So we sued the cities under the Clean Water Act to get them to stop contaminating these waters. These creeks are home to fish and are a recreational hotspot for many local residents. And when we sue, most polluters work with Baykeeper to quickly resolve their pollution problems, and that keeps the costs and penalties low. In fact, some polluters have actually thanked us for suing them and bringing the problem to their attention and helping them solve it. But Sunnyvale and Mountain View have decided to fight, and they've now dragged the litigation on for over four years. Most recently, the cities decided to try to take advantage of the Supreme Court's recent bad ruling in Sackett, which limited the scope of the Clean Water Act. The city's lawyers decided to argue that the Sackett decision meant that South Bay waterways, such as Stevens Creek and Calabasas Creek, shouldn't be protected under the Clean Water Act. It was a radical misapplication of the Supreme Court ruling. These local creeks should clearly be protected under the Clean Water Act. And fortunately, the judge in our case just agreed with us and dismissed the city's claims. So last month, we activated people around the Bay Area to take action and tell the cities to stop trying to avoid their responsibilities. Thanks to you, the cities have received more than 300 letters asking them to do the right thing. The city should stop fighting in court and instead follow the law to protect local creeks and residents by upgrading their stormwater systems and reducing pollution. And we could help them if they would let us. Put a one in the chat if you remember the massive algal bloom that turned the bay brown in 2022. All right, I see lots of responses coming in on that one. Uh, that's right, about two years ago, the bay was hit with an unprecedented algal bloom that grew out of control and turned the bay brown. Then, this past August, recreational users called us again to report that the water looked reddish brown. When we get these reports, baykeepers field investigators are often the first to the scene, sampling, 
alerting the agencies and diagnosing the problem. The scary part is always what follows the bloom, the massive die off. Countless creatures washed up dead on the bay's shorelines, sharks and sturgeon, huge striped bass and tiny minnows. It's a one-two punch. The algae spread and can release toxins deadly to fish. And at the same time, the algae die off and suck up the oxygen out of the water and that suffocates aquatic animals. We need to do something to prevent this from becoming the new normal every summer in the bay. The blooms are caused by a combination of dry weather, bright sun, and warmer waters. And the algae also need food. That's where the excessive pollution from the Bay Area's old wastewater treatment plants come into play. The Bay is one of the top polluted waters in the world for nitrogen and phosphorus. And Baykeeper is the only nonprofit group actively working on this issue and advocating to reduce wastewater pollution in the Bay. Now we've doubled down to advocate for a stronger permit that imposes stricter controls on sewage plants. That permit is scheduled to be released later this year. We're urging Bay Area regulators to issue a strong permit that supports upgrades that include wastewater recycling and wetlands restoration. This will reduce the pollutants we flush into the Bay, filter pollution out of wastewater before it's discharged, and it will have the added benefit of increasing shoreline resilience to sea level rise. A stronger permit that requires these kinds of upgrades will be a win-win-win for the Bay. And finally, last but definitely not least, put a one in the chat if you've ever walked around San Francisco and smelled the stench of raw sewage. Mm -hmm, yep, I see all those answers coming in. It's really gross, right? I've smelled it too. So I have breaking news tonight. You guys are actually getting the inside scoop. So please keep it confidential because whatever happens at the State of the Bay stays at the State of the Bay, right? I'm just kidding. We're expecting the news to break really soon, maybe tonight or publicly tomorrow morning when the Chronicle runs an in-depth exclusive. But here's the advanced scoop just for you. Baykeepers investigators just discovered that the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission is dumping an average of 1.2 billion gallons of mixed storm rot runoff and sewage into the Bay every year. Based on the agency's own data, 6% of this discharge is wastewater, which means SFPUC discharges about 72 million gallons of sewage, including raw sewage, into the bay every year. That's nearly 120 Olympic-sized swimming pools of sewer water. No wonder the bay stinks sometimes. That makes the city of San Francisco the biggest single source of sewage pollution in the bay and the single biggest contributor of the pollution that causes those harmful algal blooms that I just talked about. The other 94% of the discharges is stormwater runoff full of trash, heavy metals, and toxic chemicals. And as you know, none of this belongs in the Bay. These discharges are violations of the Clean Water Act. Cities can't dump sewage and trash into the Bay. And SFPUC's own data shows hundreds of violations over the years. Their pollution makes it really unsafe for people to go into the Bay after it rains. And as you Bay swimmers know, it forces the San Francisco Health Department to close shoreline beaches for multiple days when it rains every year. There are solutions. Just like the city of Mountain View and Sunnyvale, San Francisco needs to do the right thing and adequately update and maintain their infrastructure. They should decrease the overall amount of water they're discharging into the bay, and they need to reduce the level of pollutants in that water. Hopefully our brand new lawsuit will push San Francisco in the right direction and make the bay's water safer for swimming and fishing. Whew, okay, that was a lot. <laughs> I hope you saw that your support is helping Baykeeper tackle some of the biggest threats to the bay and improving quality of life around the bay area. And as Diane mentioned, it's our 35th year defending the bay. We started off as a scientist on a boat, Dr. Michael Herz, who I believe is watching tonight, 
Uh, and he was angry that polluters were getting away with dirty operations and government agencies weren't doing anything about it. So he created a Bay Defender and we continue to actively pr pursue that cause today. In fact, we are the Bay's only pollution patrol that's proactively investigating and deterring polluters. Baykeeper uses a unique combination of tools. I like to call it our triple threat. We investigate, we advocate, and we litigate. We have lawyers and scientists and investigators on staff who are passionate about defending the Bay because you and your families deserve to live in a healthy Bay Area. And the fun part is, because we're a science and legal-based organization, we have the facts and the laws on our side, so we win a lot. We have over 300 legal victories to stop polluters, including reducing sewage spills from 20 different cities and protecting over 1,300 acres of ponds in the South Bay from Cargill's plans to pave over them. We've helped draft and pass 14 new state laws to protect our waters from oil and coal. We've spent over 17,000 hours on patrol investigating pollution and deterring polluters. And my personal favorite is that we don't ever take money from the penalties awarded in our cases. We grant those funds to local nonprofits doing good work for the Bay. And that's resulted in over $12 million to restore the Bay, activate youth, and educate future Bay stewards. And we do all of this with a small but mighty team. We have 14 incredible staff, including legal and science experts, along with some really amazing staff who are helping us run this webinar tonight. Thank you guys. We also have 30 members on our board of directors and our advisory board who are experts in their field. We have skippers and skilled volunteers. And we don't work in a vacuum. We have core partnerships with other nonprofits and community organizations to amplify our reach and make a bigger impact. And of course, we couldn't do any of this work or achieve any of these wins without our dedicated supporters like you. So you may be thinking, I've learned so much today. I wonder how I can support these fantastic efforts. At least I hope that's what you're thinking. So I'm glad you asked. There are three ways you can get involved to defend the Bay, Baykeeper style. First, you can keep an eye out for water pollution and report it when you see it. We have a form on our website or you can email us or call us. Second, you can sign up to get monthly action alerts. When you sign Baykeepers Action Alerts, it helps polluters like the cities of Mountain View and Sunnyvale know that people around the Bay Area are watching them. And by acting together, it makes our voices louder and forces them to listen and hopefully do the right thing. And finally, if you're not a Baykeeper member already, or even if you are and you just give once a year, I'd like to encourage you all tonight to sign up to become a monthly donor. Protecting the Bay for just $10 a month, or $20 a month, or $50 a month can go a long way and make an impact. And some of you may not know this, but we stay independent by not accepting money from polluters. A big thanks to those of you who already give to us and to those of you who I know are already monthly donors. For those of you who aren't members yet, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. While a lot of folks out there lie awake at night feeling gloomy about the climate crisis and the state of the world these days, Baykeeper supporters can rest a little easier. They know they're the backbone behind an effective organization making a difference around the Bay Area. And now you can join them and feel better too. By making a gift tonight, you're also counted as a Baykeeper member. So that means when we confront entities like Valero or SFPUC, we can say we represent thousands of people living around the Bay Area. And the more members we have, the bigger impact we can make. Thanks for joining us in these different ways to defend the Bay. And thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you've learned how we we're making a difference together, and I hope you're inspired to stand by our side as we tackle the biggest threats to the Bay in the coming year. 
And look at that, Diane, I finished on time. So let's see if we can answer some questions. You're amazing. How did you do that? It's like exactly what you said it would be. So cool. Um, so there's lots of questions. We're not going to have time, of course, to answer all of them. But um, one of the ones is about the the PUC piece and and who do we call? How do who do we write? What do we do when we see the news? That's a great question. Um, we will have information and an action alert out. We we have one action alert already uh, for the San Francisco PUC to do the right thing when it comes to algal blooms. So you could definitely go on our website and sign that right now. Um, when the news comes out, we will put, be putting another action alert out to let the uh, San Francisco PUC know. So just sign up for our action alerts and then you'll get that one when it's available. And we'd love to have you sign on because the more people that send that in, the more they're going to see that people care about this issue. Yeah, cool. Uh, another question that I think a couple people were wondering, I think they've they've not gotten to spend as much time with you, is um, what exactly, what are your border, where's your boundary? Where, what's your What's your scope of action? Yeah, so we work throughout the Bay's watershed, uh, which is many, many, many square miles. Uh, and we typically work, um, depending on what the issue is and what it calls for, we'll work on a region-wide basis. So we'll work from up in Redding all the way down to Fresno and Bakersfield. We've sent field investigators out to investigate pollution in those areas to capture a dry San Joaquin riverbed, which is shocking when you think about it being the second largest river in California being dry. Uh, so we captured that with drone footage. We also captured up near um, Keswick Dam in the north area. Uh, we captured a lot of salmon fish suffocating because of a lack of oxygen and cold water. So um, there's a lot that we do in the upper watershed. And as you can see from all of our flows work, we are thinking very regionally about the entire watershed and making sure that the bay is protected throughout the watershed. Cool. Um, another question that's a little bit more detailed and might be more staffy, but um, but your staff is so fabulous. So it is. Uh, people are wondering about how you leverage the water sampling in your investigations and what tools you use. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there are, are a couple of organizations out there that do water quality monitoring on a regular basis, just ambient water quality monitoring, like San Francisco Estuary Institute, which is a partner of ours. Um, we don't do that kind of ambient water monitoring usually. We are looking at pollution, and when we see pollution, we take samples, and then we use that those samples as evidence in our advocacy, in our litigation, uh, when we try to strengthen policies, um, we are very data oriented in that way. So as we're trying to strengthen the Bay Area's um, algal blooms permit, so their nitrogen and their phosphorus permit, we are gonna be taking samples. We've got a community science program that we're starting this summer along with our partners at San Francisco Estuary Institute. And we're gonna be taking those samples on a regular basis, monitoring for nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. And that will actually go into advocacy um, to try to make that permit a lot stronger. The uh, it's so fun. See, anyway, so um, it's it's just such great work that you guys do. Oh, Somebody's asking about the Martinez refinery case. Are you involved in the Martinez refinery case? So we've been working and talking with both the local residents groups there and also with the attorneys who are working on that case. There isn't a very clear clean water angle. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this issue, the Martinez refinery has spewed many on many occasions in the last couple of years, uh, toxic ash into the air and sometimes pet coke as well. Uh, and these discharges have affected a lot of the air quality to the point where it's kind of ridiculous. The Martinez refinery sends out an alert and it says, uh, please don't go outside, please shelter in place, blah, blah, blah. And I basically read that to say, please don't breathe. And that just to me feels like they're imposing on a fundamental human right. Uh, so I'm really glad that there are community groups there that are doing a great job, um, Healthy Martinez 
is one of the groups that we work with. Um, and that there's a law firm and a couple of law firms and the state AG's office that are involved in, in litigating against that. The, um, this is one that people wonder about all the time, um, which is given the levels of pollution, how, how come people get to fish and, yeah. and when the fish they eat are, are going to make them sick? Yeah, it's a really sad situation. Um, Many people have to fish out of the bay just for food as a food source. Uh, so those who are not electing to fish, the ones who kind of have to fish, um, those are the ones that we are really working to try to protect. Uh, there's a there's a lot of different pollutants in the water that can affect the fish that that they eat, um, mercury and selenium, PCBs, and so we've been working on a pollutant by pollutant basis to try to reduce those, those pollution in the water. Uh, but we've also been working on, um, like you saw with the EPA lawsuit, uh, trying to reduce pollution at the source as well. Uh, but there, yeah, there needs to be more education around those issues. There needs to be more consideration of that in the permits that are adopted, because sometimes the standards that are set for allowable pollution don't actually take into account the fact that some people have to eat more fish out of the bay than is advisable. So it can be a real health risk. Um, something I know you're not looking at all of this. People are so appreciative of the information that you're bringing oh, good. And, and how you're, how you frame it, how you, um, how you show the action through the morass. And there are questions about what, what's the number one priority and then, um, and then also, what future threats do you see coming? They they, they want to know what you see. Yeah. Um, okay. So I don't know that I can limit it to to one. Uh, Baykeeper has eight main priorities that we work on. These are threats that our scientists have identified as the biggest threats to the bay. Um, at some point our website will reflect all eight of those. We're actually working on a new website launch, so stay tuned for that. Um, but I would say in this current moment, the biggest threats that we see uh, are definitely the flows issue. Not having enough freshwater flows into the bay is actually making our ecosystem more saline. And so with additional salt, it's actually changing our ecosystem. And the fact that the bay's critters don't have the right ecosystem or habitat to live in uh, is going to change the dynamics of the bay and the delta. So that's a big issue. Um, and then I would say the nutrient issue, the, the problem of pollution from the wastewater treatment plants that's causing there to be too much nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, that is probably one of the most critical issues facing the bay right now because there's going to be a point at which the algae grows out of control and causes dead zones around the bay. And we really don't want to get to that point where it's too late to actually help protect the wildlife and the fish that are in the bay. So I'd say those are the two biggest issues that we work on right now and are trying to prioritize. We're hoping not to see another algal bloom and algal outbreak this coming summer. And we're working really hard to make that permit as strong as possible to prevent this kind of pollution from getting into the bay for much longer. Um, and then I would say the biggest threat that I see coming is related to sea level rise and toxic sites around the bay. So this issue is one that I didn't really talk about tonight, uh, but I will probably talk about it at the future State of the Bay next year, um, just because it's something that's top of mind. There are sites around the bay that are toxic. They've been um, kind of pollution laden with different chemicals and metals in the ground from old operations. And the sea level rise issue is becoming more and more critical to think about now. Usually when people hear sea level rise, they think, oh, maybe a hundred years from now, there's going to be a problem. But no, I tried to make clear in my little slide uh, that we're going to actually see one foot of sea level rise, most likely within the next 10 years. And that's a big deal for low lying lands. So when the sea level rise gets onto these lands, you'll actually have the toxins in the, the soil leach out into the bay and leach out into communities and come into contact with people. And we're actually seeing this as a really huge problem already 
in some sites like Hunter's Point. Um, the, the problem is that water moves, as most people know. So groundwater is actually rising right now. And it, we don't even need to wait for sea level to rise because groundwater is rising as the water table is increasing overall. And so we're seeing groundwater problems actually causing pollution issues at Hunter's Point and other sites like that around the Bay. And that's already happening. So it can only go get worse from here. We need to really be prioritizing cleaning up those sites and not making really stupid development decisions that we're seeing some cities make right now. Um, building housing on shoreline sites that are going to be inundated with water in 20 or 30 years and really contaminated in 20 or 30 years. So not a good idea. The, um, the, there's a there's a recurring theme of, of people really, really, really wanting to help. Oh. And I, I think mm -hmm. that goes back to the slide that you just, you know, your, your last slide had the, had the pieces. You might want to go over that again. There are a couple little uh, more specific things about projects. So there's, have you been involved in the Redwood City Docktown Marina pollution? We have followed that issue from afar. Um, there are a lot of different politics in play there. Uh, if somebody has more information about how we should get involved from a pollution and protecting the Bay standpoint, I'm all ears. Uh, there seem to be a lot of different forces at play down there. So um, happy to happy to hear what people have to say. The um, another one is. Um, the what's happening at the Chevron refinery, and uh, in a very specific way, are they still using bioremediation um, to reduce selenium? And is that is that a way to go about it? So our refineries are discharging a lot of selenium into the bay. Uh, Martinez Refinery is probably, I believe, the biggest uh, selenium discharger, and if I'm not. I might be remembering incorrectly, but I believe Chevron is is high up there as well. Um, so these efforts are not working as well as they should be. There's still too much selenium coming out of the refineries. And so there needs to be a tightening of those standards. And that's one of the reasons that we're holding EPA accountable because they really should be revisiting these standards that they set back in 1985 and updating the limits to encourage more bioremediation and things like that, technologies like that, that will remove pollutants like selenium out of the discharges before they get into the bay. We're, we're, we're out of time. I mean, it, I'm gonna hand it back to you because people are just reverent about what you're giving them tonight. So if you have any last words, <laughs> uh, take it away, Sejal. Well, I am just so grateful to all of you guys for being here. It's been wonderful to share what we've been working on, to share some of these big updates. I'm really glad to hear that you were inspired. I'm really glad to see that so many people care about the Bay. Uh, as I said earlier, it just warms my heart that you guys have been here, you spent this time with us. Um, and I really hope that you walk away feeling like Baykeeper is doing a good job that we're effective and knowing that it's because of you it's because of our supporters that we are able to be here that we're able to be this proactive and effective and we represent you and your interests so we want to be sure that we're fighting for a healthier bay area for all of you so thank you so much for your support and i hope everyone has a good night